Yesterday was a well, yesterday was a pretty emotional day. I mean, I think you can imagine the the atmosphere yesterday, and then we closed the service with that, and and, uh, and that was that was deeply moving for Ken when we got to that uh, you know to to the video portion, and and of course it was it was uh, you know he lost his beloved wife, her sons, her sons, her son's grief was probably a little bit different. I don't know that I I could really fully understand it. I don't know that most of us could, but you know they, it, it kind of hard to put into words because. Again, they were estranged from her for so long and, and, uh, and had kind of tentatively, you know, sort of hesitantly, skeptically maybe even in, allowed her back into their life in the last few years. And, and uh, so it was a, a difficult, but they, they were so moved by that. They were so thankful to see that the mother that they, the, the Kim they knew, the mom that they knew was not the same mother, not the same woman that finished her life. They got to see the impact she had. So many of the, you know, you saw many pictures there. Of course, Sherry's in a lot of them because Sherry's like a, a glory hound. But they, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. They were dear best friends. I mean, they were best friends. They were sisters. They were they were almost twins, and and uh, you know, and and so close. And and so it was just as hard for her uh, when 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 Kim passed as it was for Ken. I think in a lot of ways. And and but she was in a lot. But a lot of those other pictures you saw, they were people whose lives that Kim reached. People, other young mothers that had to that have lost their children. She helped them through that. Other young you know addicts that uh, that were struggling with addiction, and she helped them through that. And, uh, you know, and, and, and so the, the, the point is the, but these boys had that, that was their life. Their, their childhood was disrupted because her, her, uh, young life was so, uh, was such a mess and, and, and she had been victimized by so many things. And so, you know, her early years, you know, again, she lost them and, and again, got them back. And then of course there was our loss as a church family. We, we feel the loss of Kim no longer being with us. Now, for many of you who are new, you probably didn't know Kim very well because in the last two years, years. Well, you saw the difference in the pictures of her. You saw her, she was visibly very different in the last few years. Her, her body had swollen so in so many ways. And she was, uh, she had heart trouble and kidney trouble and just so many things that doctors couldn't even figure out what it was. And the truth is it was probably years. Look, we, she was redeemed and forgiven for the years that she gave her body to things that she probably shouldn't have as we all do. Uh, but, uh, but you know, in different degrees, but that still carries consequences. Yeah. And, and she was the first one to admit that. And her body just simply gave out. And so, so, but you know, so much of Kim was a paradox. And again, I'm, I'm trying to quickly get through this to, to give you an introduction to the message here. But so much of Kim was a paradox. That, that song redeemed. Kim understood forgiveness. She understood she'd been forgiven by God. She knew God had redeemed her. That means to be bought back. She had sold her life as we all did to sin in some way and, you know, gotten involved in some things. We sort of gave that freedom up as we became slaves to something uh, in the world in, in, in terms of sin. And and, uh, and Jesus redeemed her, bought her back. And, uh, and she knew that and she believed that. And, uh, but at the same time, she could never get over her own guilt. Her, her biggest issue in life by far was the guilt she felt over having lost her children, having, having gotten into some things that made her forfeit those years, being able to be a mother and, and the other portions of her life, disappointing her family and, you know, disappointing her parents and, and, and those kinds of things. And, I chose to use, to share Jesus' message in the message yesterday. I chose to share Jesus' words when he said, he said, you know, a new commandment I give unto you. And, uh, and, and to just basically sum it up, he said, he said, here's the greatest commandment. He said, you're to love God and love your neighbor. And you know, loving God was not a problem at all for Kim. You know, loving God was not a problem. Neither was loving your neighbor. She got that. She understood that. Kim loved everybody. She had compassion for everybody. It was, it was never an issue for her. But, but then that verse continues on. If you know that verse, if you can kind of hear that verse in your mind, it, he said, thou shalt love thy neighbor. Does anybody know the next two words? As thyself. As thyself. That was the part she struggled with. That was the part she couldn't get. She couldn't love herself. She couldn't extend that love to herself. She couldn't extend that forgiveness. To her. She forgave the people who hurt her in life, but she couldn't forgive herself. And no amount of her children's forgiveness to her would help, could help her to forgive herself. And so, you know, and, and I said, you know, yesterday, and I want to make this statement, then I'll, 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 I'll bring in the, today's message. In some ways, when we think about it, you know, the Bible is filled with warnings for the rest of us. 
like, like pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. You know, we, most of us struggle with the loving your neighbor part, you know, and, and, and the, the pride issue. Those were never a problem for her. Her, her issue was, was that love for uh, herself, you know, trying to, but, but here's the thing. So I said her flaws, we all have flaws, yes? Her flaws in some ways were more noble than some of ours. Because her flaw was, she just couldn't think, she just could not forgive herself. She could not be okay with herself. And, and, uh, and so, but, but the point that I wanted to make yesterday to everybody in, atten- in attendance, and, and again, I've received so many comments from a lot of the guests were here, that you know, I said, but it's, you know, that flaw may be more noble, but it was just as crippling, if not more so than ours, you know, just as, just as crippling as, as pride. And, uh, and, and she, she could have accomplished so much more in her life if she hadn't allowed herself to live in that guilt for the, for the remainder of her life. And can I just say that's, and I want to build on that today and I want to take that to a whole different level, but I want to, I want to just challenge everyone here today. If you live with that, if, if your, if your flaw is the same as Kim, if your flaw is like Kim's where you, your biggest issue is with you. Your biggest issue is with your view of yourself. Please know that's not how God sees you. I'm not going to say another word until somebody says amen. amen. That's not how God sees you. That's not how Jesus sees you. So let me, let me, let me build on that today. I want to take this concept. This is honestly the, today, to be honest with you, this is kind of a little bit more for mature, uh, a more mature Christian crowd. David wrote in Psalm 25. We're going to jump into some scripture here. David wrote in Psalm 25 at some point in his later life. I don't know exactly when but he's writing, he gives us a study in three words that we normally put together as one. We kind of see them as one word, the same thing. But Psalm 25, David gives us a, a beautiful study here in three words that, uh, you know, although we use them interchangeably, they're not. And we need to understand the difference between them because it'll help us to understand how God does really see us. And in particular, watch, how God sees and how we relate to God during those really bad times of our lives. Now, if you, if you're here this morning and you've never had a bad period in life, like you've never had a few years where you didn't live the way you were supposed to, like if you've been a, if you've been Mr. Rogers in his prime your whole life, you might as well go on and get ahead of everybody else at the restaurant. It's like got nothing for you. This is only for people who have a period of time in their lives that they look back on and say, boy, I wish I could do that differently. Boy, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish, I wish things had been a little differently. Maybe if this didn't happen, you know, whatever that is for you, you know, that's, that's, this is who that's for. These three words, I, uh, we're going we're gonna to read them. Let me just give you the three words, though, first here. And uh, just, let me just give you the words first. First of all is the word sin and the word transgression and the word iniquity. Now, these are three Bible words. These are, these are, these are churchy words. They're Bible words, okay? And, uh, but we, use these, we sort of look at these and we see them as interchangeable, but they're really not. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into this. And I, uh, please, don't, please don't let yourself become you know, bored in, the, in, the, you know, in definition type things but, but, uh, because it's so important that we understand these. And I promise you it'll make a difference in the way you look at yourself. So let's look at the scripture here. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 7. And David writes, remember not the sins of my youth. So David is talking to God. And notice what he asked God to do. He said, God, remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. And then notice in verse number 11, we see this other word. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. You notice David has no trouble talking to God very plainly. And I, for one, am glad about that. You know, I think sometimes we get this idea when we pray that there's some, some special way we're supposed to pray. You know, we're supposed to, you know, we're supposed to stand a certain way or kneel a certain way or hold our hands a certain way, close our eyes, don't close our eyes. You know, we, we get this idea and then we have this, these words that we think we're supposed to use and we're supposed to, you know, well, I've got to do this first and this. And, and God says, why don't you just talk to me? And David understood that. And David said, God, I need to talk to you about something. I'm just going to put it right out here. He said, God, would you do me a favor? And notice, let's go back to verse number seven. Notice, he said, God, would you just remember not, would you forget the sins of my youth? Wouldn't that be something? 
Wouldn't that be a great thing? You know, I don't know about you. Uh, you know, I don't believe God is capable of forgetting. Now, God's pretty ancient. We get that, right? <laughs> but, but do you really think he can actually forget something? You know, God's not even, he's not like us. I can't remember where my keys are. I don't know where I left my coffee cup. <laughs> the older I get, right? We forget things pretty, but God doesn't really forget anything. So that actually means something different. We get that. But David is saying, God, would you, God, would you do something for me? Would you just not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions? And, you know, and, and he asks God, and, and so, so we, we kind of look at this and we wonder, what is, what is he really saying here? What is, what is David really asking for here when he says, you know, remember not my sins and my transgressions, but, but note also, you know, that it, in verse number 11, we get a little hint as to what they might mean because he asks something different about iniquity. So sins and transgressions, he said, God, I'd really like for you not to remember those. But when he comes to iniquity, he says, for thy name's sake, O Lord, look at the next word. Pardon. Pardon mine iniquity. So we're getting some hints here from David already. Before we even get into what do these words actually mean, we see that they, they obviously mean something. Obviously, iniquity is something completely different than sins and transgressions. And, and that's what I want to share with you today. So we understand God can't actually forget anything. What does the word forget mean? Well, you know, the word forget actually means to record it or mark it down. He says, so what David was really asking God was, you know, God, do you remember when I did this? And of course, God would say, yeah. God, do you remember this? And you remember this? And you remember, would you just do me a favor, God, and just not write those down? Just don't record those. Did you ever sin? Don't answer. But, you know, in our world today, it's pretty, pretty easy to send something out in a text message. And you wish, you wish that you hadn't written it down. You wish you hadn't put that in there. You wish you hadn't sent that out. You know, and this is what God is asking David, or this is what David is asking God to do. God, would you please, and look, I, you know, when I was young, when I did this, so many of the things that he's, he's, he's likening sin and transgression to youth. And, and the fact is, sins and what we're going to see is they are kind of a product of youth. Did you ever notice that, that children and adults don't really act the same all the time? Okay, so you didn't. All right, well, <laughs> it depends on the crowd. <laughs> But they, but they don't. So, so how are they different? Well, well I'll, let me get into that. But so we're, we're asking ourselves, you know, he said, God, would you just not mark it down? Would you just not record those things? And do you know how God responds to this? God actually says something about this in the scripture. And look at Isaiah chapter number 43, verse 25. God said, okay, hey, you want me to not record that? You want me to not write that down? Okay. I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake. And will not remember thy sins. Would you like for God to do that? Don't, again, don't answer, but I think we would all like for God to do that, wouldn't we? Wouldn't you love for God to just blot out those things of your youth? You know what I'm talking about. You remember when you were 16 that nobody else knew about, but God knows about? You'd like for him just to blot that out? You'd like for God to not remember those, not, 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 ha, not, 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 uh, not post those somewhere. Yeah, of course we all would like that. And, and God says, you know what? I would be glad to do that for you. I would be happy to do that for you. In fact, I will do it for you, my child. I'm actually also doing it for me. Do you see that? For my own sake. Because God says, you know what, I, I, you know, and again, not in an arrogant way, but God is such a holy and righteous father it's perfectly okay for him not to have that blot on his record. How many parents in the room? Again, don't raise your hand, please. But how many parents in the room, you feel personally responsible for what your children do? Even when they're adults. And, but you're not. But you sure love to have those blotted out, right? You'd love to have your child's misdeeds blotted out just because of how it makes you feel. And God says, yeah, I would love to do that for you. And I can do that for you. So this is what God is, you know, this is what, this is how God answered this. So, so what do these words mean? I mean, obviously we know that, that, you know, we, we know that God is not, he can't forget things and, uh, you know, and so forth. But, 
but we also, we want to know what these words mean and let's make sense of this. How does God, how are we relating to God? How is David relating to God with these three things? Let me, let me just quickly explain this to you. First of all, is the word sin. The word sin means an offense and its penalty. It's any offense. Look, the word sin means what we think it means. All right, that's the word we understand best. Uh, sin is that, is that lie that we told when we were three years old, right? And seven and 47, and 67. All right. So, so sin, that's what sin means. Sin just simply is, is any offense against God. But, but it's kind of this, uh, you know, but, but you remember what David said, he said, would you, would you not remember the sins of my youth? You know, there's something about youth. Youth is, youth is sort of much more impetuous. Youth is much more uh, spontaneous. You know, what, what, children don't have a lot of control over themselves, do they? Children have, you know, the children are much more prone to just simply act. You know, a sin is that you're, you're, you're a child, you're walking through the store, you hate being there anyway, you're already kind of in a bad mood, and there's a candy bar right there, and it's at your level, and you know your mom's not going to let you have it, so you put it in your pocket. That's a sin. We get that. It's the lie that we tell about something like that. That's, that's the sin. It's that sort of impetuous thing. But then he moves on to this thing of transgressions. And, and, uh, and by the way, by the way, that's, <laughs> there are people that you say, well, I actually had somebody recently, some mother was, you know, they, they were, I was trying to help them with some, some issues in their family. She said, well, I know my child doesn't lie to me. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> what? She said, my child doesn't lie. <laughs> That's funny because the Bible says we come forth from the womb speaking lies. Amen. You know, and, and what does that mean? Does that mean a baby is lying? Well, when a baby cries for no reason, they're, they're just looking for attention. Look, you know, I'm, I'm just saying the, the point is this is a part, these, these sins are a part of childhood. They're a part of childhood transgressions now, that's, that's a little bit different. Transgressions are a little bit, it's a, it's a bit of a step up from, uh, from, from sin. So notice a transgression is, is not so much impulsive. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's actually, it means rebellion. You see, transgression means you're, that somebody, it's when someone, we do something because we don't like the rules. It involves some planning. There's some thought going into it. There's some, there's, a, there's some knowledge. You know, again, a three-year-old, a three-year-old knows a couple of things. A three-year-old knows when he's hungry, when he's got to go to the bathroom, and when he's sleepy. And when he wants to have fun, right? That's what three-year-olds know. And that's really all they care about. And, and you know, so, they're, so they'll be driven by anything impulsively. And, and that's where these sins come into play. And that's kind of, and, we're, and we still have that to some degree. But again, there's a reason why Paul is, or why David is likening this to childhood. Because sins are much more of a childish kind of a thing. Transgression, for lack of a better way to explain it, this would be more like a teenager. <laughs> you know, a preteen. You know, there's some planning involved now. Now there's a, there's a pretty good understanding of right and wrong. There's a pretty good understanding. There's some thought going into this about, you know, why I'm going to do this. You know, there's some, there's some uh, conniving. I don't like my mom and dad's rule. This is the ice. This is where you sneaked out of your house. Boy, perfect timing, Karen. You sneaked out of your house in the middle of the night. If I'm remembering right, you did that. Didn't you? Wasn't that you? Yeah, that's what I thought. You don't have to. I have a microphone. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this is, yeah, this is the sneaking out of the, this is, you don't like your mom and dad's rules, so you, you know, you, your mom and dad don't want you seeing that boy, so you snuck out, you sneaked out in the middle of the night to, to go see him. And, you know, that's, that's, why are you looking at me like that? You know it's true. So, you know, this, see, there's some planning involved. See, this is, it's a step up, isn't it? It's, it's, it's more, it's more about it's a, it's a thought process. It's a, there's some planning involved. It's not so, you know, impulsive and so on. And David associates both of these things with youth. David is still associating these with his youth. But then we come to, you see, small children don't really plan a rebellion. Okay? But then he comes to this third thing, this, this thing called iniquity. Go back to verse number 11. You notice in verse number 11, this, this word iniquity, he comes up and he says... He, he does not ask. Watch, he's not asking God to not remember it. He's not asking God to forget all about his iniquity, whatever iniquity means, which I'll, I'll explain in just a minute. But for this, he realizes this is a whole different level. This is something more than sin. This is something more than transgressions. 
iniquity, whatever it is, he realizes there's only one way that he can really kind of move on with this, and that's if God pardons him. Now, we understand what a pardon is, yes? A presidential pardon. I'll, 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 let me come back to that. Let me tell you, first of all, what this means. The word iniquity actually means guiltiness. I'm trying to convert these into words we understand. Iniquity is a big old Bible word. All it means is guiltiness. And I'm using that instead of guilt because not everybody who does something wrong feels guilt about it. But guiltiness, being guilty. See, David, David realized that's not something that God can just forget about. That's not something that's already been recorded. And, and isn't that what we all feel, right? See, this is what Kim's issue was. Kim felt like she lived in a constant state of guiltiness. Even though, uh, you know, well, you know what? Let me, I, I've got I've to hurry here. Let me, let me show you how David deals with this. So David, David asked God to pardon him. And the reason he asked God to pardon him, what does pardon mean? Pardon means, uh, you know, it's like a presidential pardon. It means the removal of accountability or, watch, even more important, it means that it prevents the accuser from ever coming back and accusing you. It means you don't have to face an accuser. And by the way, we all know who the accuser is, yes? See, the Bible says that's what, that's what the Satan, Satan does. He accuses the brethren, always in God's ear. And, and what this does, when, when David asked God to pardon him, what he was asking God to do was get, grant me a pardon so the accuser can no longer point a finger at me. And God says, I'll be happy to do that also. I'll do that also. So let's look at this in his life. And by the way, do you, know what, do you know why he doesn't want the accuser pointing at him? Do you know why we don't want the accuser pointing at us? Because we're guilty. Because we are guilty. So if, if we have no defense... We have no defense for the things that we've done that are, that are you know, in, so, in some way evil, some way sinful, some way wicked. There's, we don't have a defense for that. There's no, there's no, uh, who, was the, who was the old comedian? You said the devil made me do it. Rodney Allen Rippey or somebody, some of you, some of you, some of you old people, you know. Yeah, that's what I thought you knew. So <laughs> I don't know who, who was it? Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson. Yeah. Yeah. Flip Wilson. Thank you. See, I knew the old people would know it. So. Yeah, you know, there's no excuses for that. There's no, there's, we're guilty. And that's why we love the idea of a pardon. Now, David understood this very, very well. There, let me, let's quickly talk about this. You know, David is, is, a, and is an interesting character in the Bible, right? They, every, most everybody knows who David is, even if they don't grow up in church, but they kind of know David for a few big stories. Most people know David because of the one big story in the Old Testament about when he killed a giant, right? David and Goliath. Everybody knows that. Most Christians know David was a king. Those are kind of the two big things that David's known for. But you know the next thing that David's known for? Sadly, I mean, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a rotten deal for him because God decided to record it all in Scripture in great detail. <laughs> Bathsheba. So David is the king. And the time when the Bible says the kings were supposed to go out to battle, he didn't. He went out onto his porch instead in the evening time. That's basically the same thing as a man sitting down in front of a computer screen getting on the Internet today. Or a woman. Or a child. Sadly. But that's basically what he was doing. So he went out on his porch in the evening time. He's looking down. He's got a view of every single rooftop. And it was just about dark. And this is when uh, the, 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 the women of the, of the town would generally go up onto their roofs. And they would, they would, they would bathe. They would, they would clean themselves. And, that's, and he's looking down on Bathsheba. She's bathing. And, and what did David do? David impulsively, impulsively... He sent for her, brought her to the house, committed adultery with her, and then realized his sin. You follow me? Adultery is a sin, yes? In his case, it was an impulsive sin, just like we've been talking about with this thing of sin. And, and, and so he commits adultery with her, and realizing his sin, he sent her back home and, and, uh, you know, and, and kind of hoped that the whole thing would just blow over. Kind of hope that it was just this one time thing, you know, and boy, I, I, it was a mistake that I made. I shouldn't have done that. Let's, he just sent her back home and he hoped it was all over. The problem is it was not. Be sure your sin will find you out, the Bible says, and it wasn't too much longer. She sends word back to him that she is with child. His. So now, 
Now David is in a position where his impulsive, his impulsiveness, that, that, uh, that, that just act of the flesh, the sin, now he has to try to think his way through what's he going to do? How am I going to deal with this? Now, David had a few options, right? One option he didn't even consider was he could have just been honest. Could have owned up to it, could have confessed. Taken the consequences for it and it would have been pretty severe. But he could have done that, but that's not what he did. Instead, we see this sin becomes a transgression. Because now David is thinking his way through it. He has a knowledge now that he didn't have before. There's, there's, he, it's no longer an acting on impulse. This is no longer something that is, is a, a sin that he just simply did. Now he is thinking his way through it. And so what he did was, you know, he, he, he finds that out. And so he, he, he calls for her husband, whose name is Uriah the Hittite. He brings him in and then he sends him home. He says, I want you to go to your wife. What's he trying to do? He's trying to get him to go home and go back to his wife and live a normal life. And hopefully then they will think the baby is his. He's trying to cover his sin, is he not? That's the transgression. Are you with me? Now watch, here's, here's the point. This is not just a, you know, preaching about sin and, trans and all that stuff. This is, we're talking about our relationship with God. We're talking about how God sees this. God saw the sin, and God would like for him to have just dealt with that and, 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 and you know, deal with it the right way, but instead, instead he took it to a new level, and he took it into this area called transgression, this rebellion. This, this, uh, he's thinking his way through it now, and he's making some decisions based on that. He's trying to cover it up, and, and this becomes something new now. And, and, of course, that doesn't work. We understand that doesn't work because Uriah the Hittite was an honorable man, and he said, I'm not going to go back and, and spend an evening with my wife while my brothers are out there fighting in the field. And so he just slept at David's door. And when David got up the next morning and found out that he was still at the palace, he hadn't gone home. Now David's got to think of a new plan. And so he sent Uriah back to the... Again, remember, this is the man after God's own heart. So can I just say, child of God, you know, what is your guilt about? So he sends Uriah the Hittite back to the battlefield with instructions to the leader, to Joab that basically sets Uriah up to be murdered, to be killed. And that's exactly what happened. And now, now David can, can uh, basically, do so with Uriah the Hittite dead, he can go ahead and take Bathsheba as his wife now. Problem solved. Right? I mean, it's, it's all good now. Because now he can just bring her into his house, he can just make her his wife, and everything's good. No, everything's not good because the guiltiness is still there. Even, so what did God do? God dealt with the sin. God dealt with the transgression. Does anybody know the story? What happened to that baby? That baby died. That was the consequence of that sin and that transgression. God dealt with that, but watch. But just because God dealt with the sin and the transgression, the guiltiness was still there, and David knew it very, very well. Now, this is where Kim was. This is what Kim was struggling with. She was struggling with the idea. She knew God had forgiven her sins. She knew God had forgiven her for those youthful things that she had done. But she still felt the unbearable weight of that guilt, didn't she? She just couldn't get over it. She just couldn't, couldn't manage to get over it. And neither can many of us. Some of us were carrying around this weight of guilt from years ago. And we know that God has forgiven us, but we haven't. And we haven't dealt with it very well, and we still feel so much weight of guilt because of that. And this is kind of where David was. You know, the human consequences were done, but the iniquity, the guiltiness remained. And so this is where David knew God better than we do. Watch. This is where David understands God better than we do, but we need to understand God the way David understood him. Because David then went, and, and, and by the way, we, we, all have, we all have sins of our youth, yes? I mean, when I say the sins of our youth, something's come to your mind probably. You know, and, and, and the closer we are to, you know, the, to, it's amazing to me how many things that I still remember. You know, David asked God to forget about, he said, God, remember not the sins of my youth, but you know what? I remember them very clearly. How about you? I remember them very clearly. I know what things I regret. I know the decisions I made that I wish I could have to do over again. And 
but God, but David knew how to deal with this. So I take you now to da- the way David dealt with this. Psalm chapter 51 is the beautiful Psalm. Many of you, if, if you're ever feeling the, tr- the weight of guilt, I promise you go to Psalm 51, you will find an ally in David. This is the Psalm that David wrote after the sin with Bathsheba, after he really realized the depth of his, his, uh, uh, where this had gone. And he's going to deal with all three of these words. Look at Psalm, Psalm 51, verse number one. So watch, he's, he's going he's gonna to mention all of these things again. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. So he's asking God to blot out his transgressions. Look at verse two. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. In verse three. For I acknowledge my transgressions, but watch this last part. What, what part of it is still sticking with David? My sin is ever before me. Now watch. David, just like we do, he still focused on those actions he did. He still focused on the act that he committed. He still focused on those sins, those things that he did. And he's, he's focused on that. God's not necessarily focused on that so much. You see, the, the iniquity is, and I, I, I didn't define that for you earlier. Iniquity is the flaw in us. Iniquity is the flaw in us that causes us to be prone to sin. Do you follow me on that? See, the sin is the action. The transgression is the planning of an action. The iniquity is the part of us that's a, so much a part of who we are. It's the flaw in our character that causes us to be prone to those things. That's the part that stays with us. And that's the part that we feel so guilty about. But we're focused on the sin. We're focused on the action. That's what David is focused on. So you notice his sins are still hanging around. So how did he deal with this? And how should you and I deal with this? When God is looking, why did, God, why did David say, God, I need you to... Would you, just, would you just forget, would you just not remember, not write down my sins and my transgressions, those things? But when it came to the iniquity, when it came to the flaw in his character, he said, God, for that, I'm going to need a pardon. God, I'm going to need something that only you can do, only you have the power to do, so that I, can't, I cannot continue to be accused, so that give me protection from the accuser. And by the way, that is exactly what happens when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Do the sins go... Does God actually forget what happened? No. You and I certainly don't forget what we did in our past, do we? But he said, but, but the accuser will have no more power over you. He won't be able to drag you into God's court and point his finger at you anymore. Because you have a pardon. Does it mean... Is that an excuse? No, is, is, the, is the, 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 the part of, well, in fact, let me, let me, let me show you. Let me, let me uh, before I get to that, look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. Here's how David dealt with it. So David reminds God, and this almost sounds like, there are a lot of people who read this and think David is making an excuse here. He said, God, I need you to, he said, God, would you please blot out these things from my record? Would you please pardon me from, uh, from this, this character flaw I have? Because, watch, behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Doesn't it sound like he's pointing at his mom and saying it was her fault? <laughs> well, it's my mom and dad that did it. It sounds a lot like, you know, that kind of started the beginning of the Bible, didn't it? You remember when God came to Adam and said, hey, you, you disobeyed me. And he said, that was the woman. <laughs> it was the woman you gave me. And then she pointed at the snake, the serpent. You know, this is, this, is kind of the, this is kind of the way we deal with things. But he said, but that's not actually what he was saying here. He said, God, remember, I was, I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. He wasn't talking about her sin. He was saying, into a condition of being prone to sin, I was born. In other words, I was born prone to sin. You and I were born prone to sin. There's a sin nature that's passed on to us. And we see it in different degrees, obviously, in our world. But we're all born with this propensity to do evil. Do we have a a, a potential to do good? Of course we do. But we also have a potential to do evil. And God says, I know that. I made you. He didn't make us that way. We, We made the world that way. But he said, I get it. That's why he's willing to offer a pardon. Now, Does that mean we can just do anything we want to do? No. 
That pardon, what that pardon does, that pardon brings us into his family. Once we're in his family, there are still consequences for our sins. Child of God, if, we, if you're under the impression that because you're a child of God, you're a Christian, you're born again, say whatever you want to call all these Bible words. If you're under the impression that that means you, can just, you have carte blanche to do, live any way you want to because you still get to go to heaven. Well, you may still end up in heaven, but that doesn't mean there's not going to be consequences here on earth. There will be consequences here on earth. In fact, the Bible says he's a loving father and loving fathers chasten their children. So, so, so this pardon just simply is, is, a, is, a, is a way for us, watch, it's a way for us to understand and frame in our minds why we do the things we do. The negative things. Why do I still have this language problem? Why do I still have this thought problem? Why do I still do this? Why do I still do that? Why do I, why do I still treat people the way I treat them? Why, do I, why am I still so angry? Why am I, all these things that we all struggle with. It's, it's, it's a way for us to understand why it's that way. And David is saying, God, I need a pardon for that. It's different from the sin. I, I'd like for you to not record my sins. I'd like for you not to do all those things and don't, don't think about those things anymore. And God said, yes, I can do that. But we're born with this potential to sin. And he said, for that, I need a pardon. Now watch verse number nine. Here's what David does about it. So, so you say, well, okay, that's, that's great. All right, so God's going to give me this pardon. I still don't feel like it. He does say, hide, he, David said, hide thy face from my sins, blot out all mine iniquities. But watch, but you and I are left with, so, okay, so how do I do that? How do I do that? How do I move on? How do I forgive me? How do I put those things behind me? How can I, watch, parents, you, you and I, str we struggle with this. How can I tell my child not to do these things when I did them? Yes, sir. <laughs> right? How can, I, how can I tell other people, you know, uh, what they need to do when I have committed those things? I'm a hypocrite. We feel like a hypocrite when we try to teach other people about things that they shouldn't do, right, that we've already done. Watch what David said. Watch what he said here. This is the textbook, and this is what we're going to wrap it up on. Watch verse number 13. He said, God, if you'll do that for me, if you'll give me this pardon for this flaw that's inside of me that caused me to commit adultery, caused me to kill somebody, caused me to do all these things. And again, we all have our, we all have our things, but I don't think anybody in this room has ever sent a man out to be killed in battle. Right. Have we? Taking his wife? I don't think so. So let's put it in perspective here. So God, if you'll do these things for me, watch what David said he will do in return. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. And see, and this is where we think, well, he can't do that. David can't give advice on marriage. David can't get, please listen to me. Don't, don't shut me out yet. David can't give advice on morality. David can't tell his children to live a certain way. David can't, because he's done all these things, right? No, actually, that's exactly why David could do these things. It's exactly why he could do it. And he realized what most of us sort of, we get the wrong idea about this. He said, no. He said, if you will pardon me for those terrible things I did, God, I promise you, I'll tell everybody not to make those same mistakes I made. That's how he moved on. That's how he put it behind him. This is what Paul did. Paul uh, one time wrote, he said, look, I, he said, you know, I, I uh, you know, forgetting those things which are behind me and looking unto those things which are before me, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Jesus. Paul never forgot the terrible things he did. He reminded people all the time, called himself the chief of sinners. He reminded people all the time about how he used to persecute the church. He didn't actually forget those things. What he did was he said, I will take all those bad things that I did and I will be that much louder telling people, don't be as stupid as I was. And that's the best testimony you could give. David said, that's how I move on. He said, I move on this way. What's verse 14? And I'm done. He said, God, if you'll pardon me, I'll tell everybody. I'll use my story to try to help as many people as I can. And then would you deliver me from that guiltiness that I feel, God? You, God, if you'll deliver me from what I, that I can't get it out of my head, God, what I did to Uriah the Hittite, but I will keep, I will keep preaching and teaching and sharing and testifying. I will help as many people as I can. And God, I think in time, you'll take away that guiltiness from me. Oh God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. 
So this is how we deal with that bad period of our lives. This is how David said you deal. This is what Kim could never seem to get her, she could never get to this point where she could, she could put that in a compartment. It's not that you forget it. Look, come on. We're never going to forget some of those bad periods of our lives, are we? And it's okay. It's actually good. Because that, but what we do need to do is we need to put them in some sort of a compartment. We realize we've been forgiven for the sins within them. We've even been forgiven for the transgressions, even the, the, the thoughtful part we had in it. But we're still struggling with the guilt. Now we take that whole thing and we wrap that up and we say, God, that's exactly what is going to motivate me to make sure my children don't make the same mistakes I made. Yes. Parents, there's nothing wrong with saying to your children, that thing you, you're, you're thinking about doing, I did it. And I'm sorry I did it. I wish I hadn't done it. It was a terrible decision that I made. Worst decision of my life. Don't do it. Um, Pretending like we didn't do it, though, is not going to be helpful to them at all. And neither is it with one another. This is what Friday nights are from, you know, when whatever problem comes in, the people that there are there on Friday night, by the way, Recovering Hope is going to change, uh, change its look here and even change the name. But it's all about people who have been there talking to people who are about to be there and trying to help them not make the same mistakes. And that's what each one of us can do. And that's also how you're going to get over the guilt.